Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the November 3rd, 1979 Greensboro Massacre in Greensboro, North Carolina, with Aaron Shetterly, the author of a brand new book on the topic, Morningside, the 1979 Greensboro Massacre and the Struggle for an American City's Soul. Aaron Shetterly, welcome to Talk World Radio. Great to be here with you, David. So for those who don't remember or never heard, what happened basically in 1979 in Greensboro, North Carolina? So in 1979 in Greensboro, North Carolina, there was a a group of labor and anti-racist activists uh, who had come together as a uh, chapter of something called the Communist Workers Party. There were a number of these chapters around the country. And they had decided that the way to create change in this country was going to be to go into factories, organize workers, and basically uh, inspire a proletariat revolution. And they were in the textile mills in Greensboro, North Carolina, which were still at that time some of the biggest mills in the whole world. Um, This is before offshoring really, you know, went into full effect. Uh, And they were struggling with building a union that included both black and white workers. a multiracial, interracial union. And they began to try to provoke, to some degree, the Klan a little bit and say, these guys are cowards. They're not going to hurt us. We need to just stand up to them. And we need to uh, understand that only by bringing white and black workers together will the the workers have a, a strong enough voice to make demands of management. And so... Uh, they decided to hold a march and a conference um, in November of 1979 in order to educate these workers about sort of the history of dividing people in order to weaken worker strength and basically increase profits for management. And uh, they were setting up uh, their um, uh, march, and all of a sudden, a caravan of Klansmen and neo-Nazis and some other white supremacist groups shows up, instigates a fight, and start shooting, and five of the activists are killed, another 10 injured, and all of a sudden we've had this disaster in 1979 in the middle of a mid-sized, you know, southern city. And this didn't totally come out of nowhere. In fact, you give a, a deep history in the book of of Greensboro, of race relations, of the civil rights movement. Uh, In some ways, this fit uh, a a pattern that, yeah, we'd like to have seen ended before 1979, but uh, wasn't totally new, right? That's part of what drew me to the story, um, was this idea that, oh, you know, we came out of Jim Crow. Things like this didn't happen, this sort of self-satisfied idea that we always progress. And... uh, and how vigilant we have to be to hold on to our gains. And here's this story that's not that long ago, right? That we can't just sort of push it off into some, you know, well, we've surmounted that past. And um, uh, Greensboro has such an interesting history because it likes to present itself as a progressive Southern city, a city that in a sense doesn't have the race problems that some other deep South cities have. you know, when the sit-in movement started in Greensboro in 1960, eventually Greensboro became very proud of the fact that there wasn't the kind of violence that you saw in Birmingham, Alabama and some other places in the South with, you know, fire hoses and dogs and, you know, police beating protesters. The real story is much more complicated than that, that there was a huge amount of effort to keep schools segregated in Greensboro. There was a huge effort to make sure that, you know, in a white majority city that uh, Black people maybe had a token seat on city council but weren't being represented in their neighborhoods. Um, And at the same time in Greensboro, you had a highly educated, there are two Black colleges there, a state college, North Carolina A&T, and a private women's college, Bennett College you had this incredibly ambitious, educated Black population that was pushing up against these restrictions and these low ceilings. 
um, and uh, were getting angrier and angrier about being kept in their place. Quote, unquote. For the people who can't see me, I was just doing air quotes. <laughs> and yet at the same time, uh, you had some problems uh, with Ku Klux Klan, with Nazis, with the police, local and federal. Uh, I mean, this, this massacre uh, was with the complicity of the so-called law enforcement, right? You know, this is the thing that Greensboro struggled with admitting for decades and decades. And, you know, some of the, the federal agencies have never admitted their complicity in this. But uh, to begin that conversation, to put it very simply, the uh, both the feds through the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and the Greensboro Police Department, who were using a, a uh, informant, a Klan informant who had worked for a decade with the FBI as well, and was still going over to his FBI handler, despite the fact he wasn't informing for the FBI and telling him what he was seeing and what was going on, had enough information to know that what was coming on November 3rd, 1979. They could have stepped in and prevented violence. There were another number of ways to do that. One, they could have told the marchers that they thought there was real danger. Another is they could have established a presence. Instead, the very top of the Greensboro Police Department said that they would take a low profile approach to this march. In other words, there would be no policemen visible to the marchers. So when the caravan of Klansmen and neo-Nazis rolls up that the police knew was coming, the informant had called his police handler twice that very morning, uh, if not three times, there's some dispute about that third call, uh, there was no one there. And this is the thing is that the, the activists at this point, these were seasoned, you know, activists who'd been doing this in North Carolina for more than a decade. They'd had lots of marches, lots of rallies. They'd never been had staged a rally in which there were no police. It had never happened. So then when they came and all of a sudden they realized there were no police there, they thought, boy, is this strange. Yeah. And there was a reason and it wasn't a good one. Um, and who were some of these activists and what was their what was their strategy and what was their march going to be this was a march they advertised with with death to the clan flyers right mm -hmm. it's a tricky moment for them they had gone into the mills a couple years earlier and had some been building some real success and then the mill management had been more successful in sort of isolating them and pushing them out of the mills. And so they were trying to figure out how to get traction again. And one of the ideas was they would start their own union. But the head of this Communist Workers Party was in New York. And he said, you know, what we really need to do now is be more militant. We need to raise our profile. We need to grow our party. Well, before that, the strategy had been, in a sense, much more long term. Let's just build the unions, let's, you know, do organizing work little by little and build towards something more just. And so they took a more aggressive, radical stance against the Klan and really wanted to sort of raise their profile by bringing people together against the Klan and white supremacy. Um, and there, uh, four months before that, uh, in a little town, the Klan had been staging a sort of promotional moment, which they were going to film the, the racist 1950 film, Birth to the Nation, and try to recruit some new members. And the Communist Workers Party, along with that local Black community there, marched on this. Well, the Klansmen and Nazis at that event were armed with automatic weapons and pistols and rifles, and they came face to face and really, I think the only thing that prevented some violence at that point was about three, two or three policemen who they told the Klan and Nazis to go back into this little community center. It was a, a terrifying moment, but one that gave the Communist Workers Party the idea that they had backed them down, that you know they had sent them scurrying back, these cowards scurrying back into this community center. And you know the Klan and Nazis said they wanted revenge. Now, would they have actually done anything about that? I don't know, because the, the 
the piece here, when people talk about that, that they leave out, is that it was actually the police informant, this guy named Eddie Dawson, who goes down to a Klan rally and tells these Klansmen how embarrassed they should be about this and that they should come seek revenge in Greensboro. It's only after that that they organize a caravan to come to Greensboro in November. It's incredible how often there is an informant and how often the informant is actually the instigator. Um, this is this is also throughout U.S. history. Yeah, and I mean, and the FBI has such a long history with this, right? And and one of the questions that comes up in the book is how much political violence, you know, was actually instigated by FBI informants as the FBI stood by and took notes. I mean, you can think of the the Freedom Rides and 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 uh, the FBI being involved with the sh Chicago police and murdering Fred Hampton in Chicago. I mean, it goes on and on what they did to the Black Panthers. Uh, and this is another example, um, it seems to me, of uh, the FBI, even though this is after the church committee and after some new guidelines, playing by some old rules um, that they weren't supposed to be using. We're talking with Aaron Shetterly about the brand new incredible book, Morningside, the 1979 Greensboro Massacre and the Struggle for an American City's Soul. Uh, Aaron, you've started to touch on this, but one of the things I like a lot about the book, and we've talked about this, is, is how it covers the local civil rights movement and the national and the interaction uh, between players and between actions uh, at these levels that creates a, a new sort of civil rights history. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, um, Nelson Johnson, who's the organizer of this march that ends up um, being attacked uh, on November 3rd, 1979, has this really interesting history. He escapes the family farm to go into the Air Force. While he's in the Air Force, begins to get radicalized by some um, other Black uh, Air Force members who um, are moving toward Black power and away from King, Martin Luther King Jr. And Nelson comes back and, and immediately at North Carolina a and University in Greensboro, uh, becomes an activist very quickly, um, gets involved, and becomes more and more radical as he sees the resistance to some of the things that he wants to do, like fair housing, and, uh, you know, workplaces that are humane, um, and equal access to bars and restaurants and things like that. And even though this is after the sit down movement, there's still places where it's not okay to go if you're a black person or certainly not okay to go if you're an interracial couple in Greensboro. And, um, and so uh, very quickly, there's, you begin to see this interplay between the national politics and the local politics happening. So for example, uh, and this is sort of an early example prior to this is in the uh, mid 60s, there's something called the North Carolina Fund. It's a, it's a LBJ's uh, precursor to LBJ's war on poverty. And what they're trying to do is to empower poor people around North Carolina, white people, white poor people, black poor people, Native American poor people to stand up in their communities, take uh, uh, a more active role in the democracy of their local places. And the white power structure in Greensboro, I mean, in North Carolina is totally rattled by this. And the complaints come in. And when Nixon comes into power, he actively shuts this program down. Well, when he does that, you see that Nelson and his allies in North Carolina see this happen in front of them. In other words, that the, the national government is not going to stand on the side of poor people uh, of white or black poor people, and they're using race baiting in order to shut this down, saying, you know, Negro rule, Negro rule around North Carolina and terrifying poor white people. And uh, all of a sudden, this tether that there is between sort of the liberal establishment, right, and these activists on the ground is, is snapped, and they become more radical and sort of lean into this sort of their radical approach to politics at the local level. So it's just the way that interplay happens. That's very interesting to me. 
it, it is indeed uh, to see these these changes uh, play out at the local level, and not just radicalization, but greater acceptance of violence and talk of violence and arming for violence. Um, and this ends up, uh, I, I don't want to give everything away because I want everybody to read the book and not everybody knows this story, but numerous court cases and congressional hearings and civil cases and truth and reconciliation commission. Uh, what, how does this play out and what does anybody learn from it? You know, what's interesting, you know, we talk about sort of American amnesia, right? The way we forget our own history in order to tell ourselves the stories about ourselves that we like better. Um, it's so interesting. You bring back all these uh, court cases and these federal hearings about what happened in Greensboro. In a way, it was extremely high profile. But on another way, so few people have any idea about this history at all. Um, and yeah, I mean, the shooters, I mean, just to be put a point on it, no one was ever held criminally responsible for those five deaths and 10 injured people, not a single person. And, you know, we're not talking about 1930 here again. All these trials were in the 80s. Um, and then there was a final trial in which this modicum of justice, you know, there was a, 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 a wonderful federal judge named Robert Marriage out of Richmond in the fourth district. No North Carolina judge would hear what ended up being the last trial, which was a federal civil trial. They were all didn't want to get wound up in the complexity of, you know, a trial with communists and Klansmen. Like, who could win if you're a judge, right? And this guy from Richmond comes down and sits for months at this trial and does as fair work as he could wring out of the justice system. And for the first time, it, perhaps the only time that I'm aware of in American history, Klansmen, neo-Nazis, and police uh, officers, Greensboro police officers, were found jointly liable for death. Um, it was a, a tiny sliver of the justice this deserved, but it was a something to hold on to. Libel in civil court for yeah. murders that they had been acquitted of or never charged with in, in criminal court. Um, it, it is amazing that something can be a big story one week, but if it isn't made into history, if it isn't remembered as a big event of that year and that decade and that century, it can be utterly forgotten. Uh, it can just be erased. And so it's it's critical that you're, that you're bringing this story back. Um, did, did anyone involved in the, in the massacre ever apologize or regret uh, in any way? Uh, because some of the activists admitted their mistakes, regretted things they had done that led up to, uh, that provided an excuse even for this massacre. Um, but did anyone responsible for the murders do that? No. Um, until... Uh, 2020, really. Um, and, and this is interesting because uh, the police department was willing to say that maybe the low profile approach uh, wasn't adequate. Well, that's pretty true. Um, but uh, over the years, the activists who, as you say, and, and, and very movingly, and this was so important to me to hear, you know, that them talk about the mistakes they made, that they should have called this death to racism march instead of death to the Klan, that they should have made it impersonal rather than personal. And, you know, some of the name calling that they did uh, wasn't right. And, you know, and then they, most of them renounced sort of some of the communist principles of, uh, you know, democratic centralism and dictatorship of the proletariat, too. And, and Nelson Johnson became a pastor and uh, believes in the, uh, the possibility and the human dignity of every single person, right? That, uh, and, and I really tried to approach this book that way, too, by writing about all the different characters from different backgrounds generously, rather than making them one-dimensional. But, you know, the activists kept putting pressure on the city to admit its responsibility. 
it's very interesting that right after Charlottesville happened, all of a sudden, the Greensboro City Council in 2017, two or three days later, issued a spontaneous apology for what had happened in 1979. It was almost bizarre, right? And uh, But they didn't say what they were apologizing for. They just apologized. So the activists and, and some pastors and different people in Greensboro pushed for the next few years to get them to actually define what it was they were apologizing for. And in 2020, in the, you know, in the depths of COVID and in the wake of the George Floyd murder, um, all of a sudden the Greensboro City Council announced a resolution of apology in which they admitted that the police could have stopped the violence and hadn't. And it was a pretty powerful moment. And not only did they do that, but they named a local scholarship in the names of the five people who were killed that day on November 3rd. Five communists are now, in a sense, uh, memorialized in Greensboro with scholarship money for students coming out of the, the predominantly black high school there who are interested in social justice. So it's a unusual and pretty wonderful thing. An, an important step, one of many that were taken after there was a Nazi rally about seven years ago here in Charlottesville, uh, where my guest Aaron Shetterly and I are both uh, living. And I wish Charlottesville were not shorthand for that Nazi rally, because it's actually a, a city where lots of people have lived for many, many years. But <laughs> But so many other places did such good things, taking down statues, apologizing for massacres after that. And it took us until just recently to get the city of Charlottesville itself to do anything, to take down its statues. Um, but I, 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 I'm always struck by, you know, the success in Greensboro of the sit-in at the lunch counter that's now in the Smithsonian, that lunch counter, and, and of, the, of the nonviolent activism of the civil rights movement being so quickly discarded by so many people within five or 10 years, we must have violence. Uh, and you see limited success from that, I think, in general. And even in this particular story, you see some of these people like Nelson Johnson uh, have greater successes, I think, in later decades using different strategies uh, of nonviolence. Um, it seems to be it, it, the, the need to do things in a way that brings people in rather than scares people away, if you're, if you're organizing a mass movement, seems to be a lesson we have to learn over and over again. That's such an interesting point. You know, I don't think we can underestimate the loss of Martin Luther King Jr. as a, a voice when he was killed in 1968. And this becomes very personal in my story because Nelson Johnson had actually been selected by the head of the NAACP in Greensboro. He was identified at that point as this up and comer, this guy who was probably going to be a, you know, a senator or something. You know, he had that kind of energy and uh, charisma and intelligence that he, people in Greensboro's Black community thought this guy's going to go far. And he had been picked to meet Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th, 1968 at the airport in Greensboro and bring him in to give a political rally for a black man who was running for governor of North Carolina. And King wrote to say, no, he had to stay with the workers on Me in Memphis and then was killed that day. And, you know, Nelson had said, I'm gonna ask him about nonviolence. I wanna talk to him about it. I'm not sure I understand it. I'm not sure that it is the most effective way. And he was looking forward to engaging that conversation. It was a conversation he never got to have. But I think the other point, David, that's really important, you know, when we're talking about this, is the degree of violence to which a lot of these activists who then turned to violence were subjected to. Like the, the number of guns pointed at them, the amount of tear gas shot at them, the, you know, the threats of the police toward them, that some of it was out of fear, you know, that and what do I do? How do I protect myself? Well, I'm going to put a gun in my car, you know, and maybe it's the wrong decision, but it's, I can understand it in that context of, wow, this is, you know, I'm trying to push for some basic things, healthcare, housing, you know, good, better education, more equal schools. And you're, you're like putting me in jail, roughing, beating me up and spraying me with tear gas. 
right? The, the violence of the other side is always understood, misunderstood as an argument for violence by your side. And so it's not just the loss of King, but that he's killed by violence, which is some sort of argument to prove that nonviolence didn't accomplish all the incredible things it was accomplishing. Um, we, we've got just three minutes left. Aaron Shetterly, why did you choose this topic? How did you choose it? And how did you go about this? Uh, it's an incredible work. Thank you. I uh, was actually in um, Greensboro with my father, who is a painter, as you know, David, because you are one of his portrait subjects of Americans who tell the truth. Um, and there was a show at the um, uh, the Civil Rights Center and Museum right in Greensboro of these paintings. And the woman who organized that said, uh, there are these two people you have to meet. And so my dad and I and my wife, Margot, went and sat down in this little cafe and spent two hours talking with Nelson and Joyce Johnson. And I walked out thinking, how the heck do I not know this history? And feeling not only that, but that it opened up, you know, um, some questions, deep questions I'd had about the post-King period and the tactics you're, and strategies that you're talking about and how to understand them and how people came to these different ideas about how change would happen. But there was something very powerful in where the Johnsons had ended up. You know, here were these people I was sitting with who were persistent, they were adaptable, and they were exuding love. And I thought, how do these people who've suffered this kind of trauma have that kind of energy? And I thought, I want to be around them more. I want to know their story. And I want to see how they move from, you know, Black power to communism to a sort of liberation theology, which is also nonviolent and following the model of King now. It's an incredible story and surprising twists and amazing steps taken by Nelson Johnson and Joyce Johnson. Um, I cannot recommend the book highly enough. It is called Morningside, the 1979 Greensboro Massacre and the Struggle for an American City's Soul by our guest, Aaron Shetterly. Aaron, thanks so much for writing this book and for coming on Talk World Radio. Great to talk with you, David. Thank you so much. Aaron Shetterly will be taking part in an online book club as a fundraiser for World Beyond War, during which he will discuss his book with up to 18 participants online during four sessions over four weeks, and registrants will get a free signed copy of the book as well. You can learn more about the online book club at worldbeyondwar.org. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.